Good morning or good afternoon, I'm not sure which. Um, my name is uh, Anthony Komaroff, and I thank you for inviting me to participate in this important conference. Um, I understand that there are biomedical scientists, health professionals, and members of the general public listening, and I'm going to try to make my remarks clear to everyone although there will be some slides that mainly are for scientists and health professionals. Most of the studies I'm going to talk about compare pay people with ME-CFS to healthy control subjects of the same age and sex. So let me begin. About the mid 1980s, interest in what we now call ME-CFS became uh, much greater. Uh, and at that time, what we had was an illness defined by a group of symptoms, but there were at that time no known underlying biological abnormalities that might explain the symptoms. And so many people asked, understandably, is there really anything wrong in people with MECFS? Is there any objective pathology. Today, I think we have a different kind of problem. There are so many different measurable objective abnormalities in people with MECFS that involve so many different parts of human physiology that people ask, how can all of these things possibly be wrong? But the proper question to ask, in my opinion, is how can all of these abnormalities be tied together into one disease process? There are in fact multiple pathophysiologic abnormalities in MECFS. For one thing, it is post-infectious in many, if not all people. And that's not a surprise. We've known for many years that a post-infectious fatigue syndrome can follow after infection with a whole group of different viruses, bacteria, even parasites. Uh, so a post-infectious fatigue syndrome is a well-documented condition. The question we don't know the answer to is, are all of these post-infectious fatigue syndromes uh, sharing the same underlying pathophysiology. In this slide, uh, I, and many of the slides, I have a group of footnotes to the literature that I am summarizing. Uh, these copies of these slides, for those of you who want to pursue the footnotes, will be available at the, uh, the, at the end of the meeting. Another area of pathophysiologic abnormality is immune activation. In the original immunologic studies, three different kinds of abnormalities were repeatedly shown by different laboratories studying different groups of patients with MECFS. Increased numbers of CD8 cells that were activated an upregulation of the 2,5-A system, which is an antiviral system, uh, and increased production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And that was interesting because we knew in the late 1990s that cytokines, when they were used for therapeutic purposes, such as interferons or interleukin-2, when they were given for therapeutic purposes, they produced symptoms that are very similar to MECFS. So it was attractive to believe that the increased cytokines that were seen in MECFS might actually explain the symptoms. The best study of that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences several years ago by Jose Montoya, and Mark Davis from Stanford. What they studied, this is a very big study, 192 MECFS cases and nearly 400 healthy controls 
in which in each of these people, 51 different cytokines were measured. And what they found with many of the cytokines was that as the level of the cytokine went up, the severity of the symptoms went up. That there did appear to be a correlation between the levels of the cytokines and the symptoms. Another kind or area of abnormality in MECFS involves B cells and autoantibodies. B cells, as many of you know, lead to plasma cells, which lead to antibody production. There are a variety of B cell abnormalities that have been documented in people with MECFS. Increased numbers of certain B cell subsets, gene expression patterns that suggest an impaired differentiation and survival of B cells, increased levels of a particular activating factor, and an increased frequency of HLA alleles that are associated with autoimmunity. And speaking about autoimmunity, there have also been many studies finding autoantibodies in people with MECFS. These are antibodies produced by the body, and the normal function of an antibody is to recognize something foreign that has entered the body and to attack it. But autoantibodies are antibodies made by the body, not to something foreign like a virus, but to the body's own tissues. And many such autoantibodies have been found in people with MECFS, and many of them here in yellow are directed against nervous system targets, central nervous system, autonomic nervous system. And we'll come back to that in a little while. Another area of abnormalities in people with MECFS is oxidative stress or redox imbalance. Here are three markers of oxidative stress, HDL cholesterol, oxidized LDL cholesterol, and isoprostanes. And in each case, there is a significant difference indicating oxidative stress in the people with MECFS as compared with the healthy control subjects. Here's another study measuring lactate levels in the spinal fluid in people with MECFS compared with healthy people and people with generalized anxiety disorder, a highly significant difference in lactate levels and as a result in pH uh, in the spinal fluid of people with MECFS. Another area of abnormality is defective energy metabolism and a hypometabolic state. This is an area that really was invisible to us until the last 15 years. A new set of technologies, the omics revolution, has allowed scientists to, in a single sample of fluid like blood, measure huge numbers of different molecules. Metabolites, which are the products of metabolism, tend to be small molecules. Proteins, which are typically bigger. Uh, the ability to simultaneously in the same sample of fluid or blood, uh, so many hundreds, even thousands of different metabolites allows scientists to address questions that couldn't really be addressed previously. And what the first studies of metabolomics in people with MECFS seem to be showing are that First and most interesting, the levels of most metabolites tend to be lower. And that's interesting because that's a pattern 
that one sees in hibernating animals, for example, where the animal has throttled down metabolism in order to preserve energy for the vital functions to survive. Another abnormality shown in metabolomic studies are abnormalities that incriminate the impairment of cellular energy uh, indicated by the, the availability of NADPH and oxidative phosphorylation. I'll show some data in a minute. Another observation has been the a possible defect in one critical enzyme in energy metabolism, pyruvate dehydrogenase. And finally, there are multiple abnormalities shown in converting all of the key sources of energy into energy. So defects in pathways that convert sugars, lipids, and amino acids into energy as well as oxygen into energy. This is one good study uh, showing reduced oxidative phosphorylation in people with MECFS compared with healthy control subjects. This all begs the question of why is energy metabolism being shut down or reduced not eliminated, but reduced. Uh, and we'll come back to some theoretical speculation about that. Another area of abnormality that increasingly seems to be involved in MECFS is a pro-inflammatory gut microbiome. Probably everyone has heard of the microbiome and microbiome studies, but let me set the stage. We've known for 200 years that many microbes, bacteria, viruses, other kinds of microbes, live on us and inside us. But what we have thought until very recently was they were just uh, along for the ride. They were there inside us because we provided a warm home and uh, some nutrition for them to stay alive. And then we thought that they were just there. They did not affect our health in any way. What we have learned in the last 15 years is profoundly different. It is that the bacteria that live on us and certainly in us, particularly in our intestines, profoundly affect our health in many different ways, and that is not the subject of today's talk, so I can't go into it, but what, what we know now is that uh, an imbalance in the organisms that are in our gut can lead to inflammation in the gut, which leads the wall of the gut to be leaky and more easily penetrated by bacterial products and by bacteria themselves, which find their way into the bloodstream when they should not do so. Uh, and that leads to an activation of inflammation throughout the body and may trigger autoimmunity. And that inflammation in the blood can penetrate the barrier between the blood and the brain and lead to activation of the immune system in the brain or neuroinflammation. And there are two routes by which inflammation in the gut activates inflammation in the brain. A, a route through the blood, the humoral route, and also signals that go up the vagus nerve from the gut directly into the brain and set the brain's immune system on fire. There are also abnormalities of the autonomic nervous system, dysautonomia. The autonomic nervous system is the part of the nervous system that controls the body's vital functions. 
our pulse rate, our breathing rate, our blood pressure. Uh, and there are many ways of testing the function of the autonomic nervous system. One of them is to put people on a table, strapped to the table, lying flat down. And then the table is tilted up. And now gravity is pulling on the blood in all of the circulation. And what are the consequences of that? In healthy people, shown here in these red bars, the blood flow to the brain goes down a little bit when suddenly the body is upright. But in people with ME-CFS, it goes down a lot more, enough to produce many different symptoms. So finding all of these different areas of abnormality in people with MECFS may seem like it's like the story of the blind men discovering the elephant. I'm sure you've heard that story many times. One blind man thinks that the ear of the elephant is a fan, and another thinks that the tusk is a spear, and another thinks the trunk is a snake, and one thinks the, the leg is a tree, and another thinks the body of the elephant is a wall, and another finds the tail to be a rope. And MECFS these days can seem like that because some blind men are saying it's neuroinflammation and some are saying it's dysautonomia or it's redox imbalance or it's impaired ATT, ATP production or it's autoimmunity or it's a microbiome problem. And so sometimes scientists ask, well, make up your minds. Which one is it? Which one is it? And my answer to that question is, the elephant is all of these things. It's not one of them. And the question for scientists is, how are all of these things connected in the disease process that underlies MECFS? Because all of these things are connected. In a recent review article, uh, we sketched out just some of the connections about how these different abnormalities affect each other and affect each other in both directions. So oxidative stress causes inflammation and inflammation causes oxidative stress. Oxidative stress causes mit mitochondrial dysfunction and mitochondrial dysfunction causes oxidative stress. These things are all connected. And what we need to do is understand the connection. The other thing we need to do is understand, understand how this combination of connected abnormalities produces the symptoms of MECFS. There we are, we have less scientific uh, data to, to guide us, but I would like to put forward today one attractive hypothesis for which there is some evidence, and that's the sickness symptoms hypothesis. What do we mean by that? Many people with MECFS say in so many words, MECFS is like the flu, but it's like a flu that never goes away. Many people say that. Well, what does it feel like when we get the flu? Probably most of us have gotten the flu or another acute infectious syndrome. What do we feel like? We know what we feel like. Why do we feel that way? And then why several days or a week or two later does it go away? What's happening? that causes those symptoms when we get the flu. We know from many studies in many different kinds of animals that there is a hardwired, biologically determined process in our body that is a temporary acute response to injury and to infection, where the brain 
generate symptoms that lead to a decrease in energy consuming activities. They make us lethargic or tired, less interested in social connections, achy, we don't wanna move around very much, sleepy, we don't wanna move around, loss of interest in sex, difficulty thinking, depression, reduced appetite. And so our behavior changes in a way that we do less of activities that consume a lot of energy so that the energy we do have is used to fight the infection. That's a healthy response and it's a ubiquitous response in animals. And it's turned off in ways we don't fully understand when the war against the virus is won. And the question is, are there circumstances in which this acute response, it's supposed to only last a while, becomes stuck and can't get turned off and produces symptoms chronically? We know that this sickness symptom behavior is seen in most animals, even in vertebrates. And if you think about it, it's not hard to tell when your pets are sick. They act and look like you feel when you have the flu, when you're sick. It's a preserved response in the animal kingdom. It has a clear a virtue, which is to save the energy we have to fight the battle we need to fight. But maybe it becomes stuck in some people. What's happening neurobiologically? This theory postulates that somewhere in the brain, there are a group of neurons, a nucleus of neurons that have one function, when they are activated, they produce all of the symptoms, the sleepiness, the loss of appetite, the achiness, all of those symptoms are activated by this nucleus when the nucleus is activated. Where in the brain is that nucleus? That's speculative, but I'll talk about one possible location in a minute. So what activates this nucleus? It can be activated by the immune system of the brain when it is activated, when there is neuroinflammation. And it can be activated by inflammation elsewhere in the body that, as I said a minute ago, sends signals to the brain that activate the brain's immune system. There also are a group of other possible triggers of this nucleus in the brain. So what's the evidence for this theory? Uh, do people with ME-CFS in fact have evidence of neuroinflammation? The answer is yes, there are several good studies that show that, but I don't have time to show them. Is neuroinflammation in fact a cause of fatigue? Again, there are several good studies that show that. I don't have time to show them. Perhaps we can do so during the questions. Is there a fatigue nucleus and where is it? Well, there isn't a fatigue nucleus in humans that has been identified, but last year in the journal Nature, there was a torpor nucleus identified in mice uh, that elicits a hibernating-like behavior where animals don't move, their metabolism slows down, they become hypometabolic, and it's tempting to speculate that this nucleus, which in mice is in the hypothalamus, uh, something like it may exist in humans. All of this is laid out uh, in more detail than I have time for today in two recent review articles uh, just published in the last few months, one with my colleague Ian Lipkin at Columbia 
and the other with my colleagues, Bindu Paul and Solomon Snyder uh, at Johns Hopkins University and the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. So in summary, uh, MECFS is not imaginary. It has underlying biological causes, including an infectious trigger in many, immune activation and neuroinflammation, autoantibodies, oxidative stress, defective energy metabolism, autonomic nervous system abnormalities, and a pro-inflammatory gut microbiome. These abnormalities are all connected and they reinforce each other and they lead to multiple potential vicious cycles. I think they are likely to be the cause of the chronic sickness symptoms, possibly by stimulating a nucleus in the brain that is responsible for those symptoms, that is there to produce those symptoms when we need it, and is somehow being chronically activated in a way that chronically produces the symptoms of the illness. That is not a proven theory, but it certainly is, in my opinion, a theory worth pursuing with investigation. So I thank you again for inviting me to participate, and I look forward to the question and answer session. Thank you very much. <laughs>